Thank you very much for participating in this press conference today on Samantha Cristoforetti's soon to be launched Minerva mission. My name is Ninja Menning. I'm the head of Newsroom and Media Relations at the European Space Agency, ESA, and your moderator today. I'm supported by a team in the background, monitoring your questions and feedback with the goal to answer them all, of course. Just for clarification, this event is divided in three parts. Um, after short introductory speeches by each of the panelists, we will start the first Q&A with Samantha roughly 15 minutes later in English language to be followed around quarter to four by the second Q&A in Italian language. And we will close the event not later than 4.30. So for all of you that would like to ask a question in Italian and get an answer in Italian, I would like to ask you to wait for the second part of the Q&A session. Next to ESA astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti, we have as panelists today Josef Aschbacher, ESA Director General, Vittorio Cola, Italy's Minister for Technological Innovation and Digital Transition, Giorgio Saccoccia, President of the Italian Space Agency, ASI, and David Parker, ESA Director of Human and Robotic Exploration. Um, I would like to ask you, Samantha, to share a few words with us first, before I give the word to Yusuf again, about how you're feeling today and uh, what are you looking forward to? Absolutely. Thank you, Ninia, and uh, thanks for uh, everyone being here. Uh, of course, uh, Minister Colau, it's a pleasure to see you, sir. Uh, President Sakocha, Director General Ashbacher, uh, Director Parker. Um, yeah, i am uh, completed my training. I am in quarantine. I am looking forward to a launch uh, in a uh, little less than uh, a couple of weeks. It's been... Uh, an amazing ride so far. I have a fantastic crew of uh, three NASA astronauts who would fly to me out of uh, uh, Cape Canaveral uh, on a Dragon spacecraft uh, that we named uh, Freedom. Uh, we will join up there the uh, veteran crew, Crew 3, that includes my fellow ESA astronaut uh, of German nationality, Matthias Maurer. So I think both Matthias and I are really looking forward to this uh, rather rare event of having uh, uh, two uh, European astronauts in space at the same time. Those guys from Crew 3 will, uh, you know, they are the veterans. They have done a fantastic job up there in the last uh, uh, close to six months. And uh, they will have a few days in which uh, they will have to cram a lot of knowledge and experience in us so that we can then carry on all the activities, especially the science and research activities on space station. And then, of course, up there waiting for us, there are also our three uh, Russian crew members, uh, Oleg, uh, Sergei, and uh, Dennis, who launched uh, on Soyuz a couple of weeks ago. And so together with them, we will stay for our ent the entire duration of our mission, which is foreseen until around the mid of uh, September. And we will uh, be all together Expedition 67. Uh, welcome also from my side. Uh, thanks a lot. I uh, was very happy to hear Samantha uh, jumping in and uh, filling the gap. Also very warm welcome uh, from my side to Minister uh, Colau, to uh, Giorgio, and of course all the journalists uh, who are uh, here with us. Uh, a few introductory words. So first and foremost, let me just reassure you that uh, life on the space station is nominal. Uh, we have, uh, of course, as you know, Matthias Maurer in the space station. Uh, he's conducting the experiments. Uh, uh, he's uh, doing his uh, plan of work, which is a very busy one. Uh, he recently had uh, a seven hours uh, EVA, uh, and this was very successful. There was a small uh, issue with, the, uh, with some water in the helmet, as you know, which we are currently investigating. But other than that, uh, I should say that uh, uh, Matthias is doing a really, really good work. Also, I'm sure you have heard that uh, uh, just uh, uh, this weekend, the Axiom 1 mission uh, was docking on the space station. So the uh, people in the, our colleagues in the space station uh, got some visitors uh, for uh, commercial uh, astronauts, uh, the first uh, fully commercial flight of uh, SpaceX, of the Endeavour uh, spacecraft. Uh, and this is quite some news because it is uh, something that uh, is a change of uh, how the space station has been used in the past and I think very important to, to note as well. Uh, also important to recall is uh, the human exploration uh, activity we are doing in Europe uh, at the Space Summit in uh, uh, on the 16th of February uh, this year uh, with all the 
uh, ministers of the ESA and EU member states, uh, plus uh, uh, President Macron, uh, inviting and also giving a very nice speech. We as ESA, we got a mandate to establish a high-level uh, group of uh, experts or advisors uh, to advise us on how to proceed in Europe on human exploration. And this is certainly uh, a topic that is extremely important. It will take time to reflect. We will ask mostly non-space people uh, to uh, reflect on the topic, explorers, economists, uh, historians, uh, really people from different walks of life uh, to give us feedback and then prepare decisions uh, for uh, politicians for another space summit, uh, which we plan uh, in uh, the last, at the end of uh, next year, around November uh, next year, uh, under the uh, chairmanship or presidency of uh, uh, the European Union by Spain and of ESA by Germany. And this uh, certainly is a very important highlight uh, in order to clarify and consolidate uh, the European role in exploration. Also quite important to mention is our preparations within the context of the ministerial. Uh, David uh, sitting right next to me, uh, together with me and our colleagues and of course the member states, we are preparing a very important package uh, on exploration, which covers uh, all elements of it, uh, from Leo to Moon, Mars, uh, uh, exploration, of course, uh, robotic and uh, human. Uh, and this is certainly a very important aspect. Maybe also worth mentioning is uh, a very strong cooperation we have with NASA on several aspects, obviously on the space station, but also on some other elements of uh, exploration, which uh, uh, we have we are preparing right now towards the ministerial. And last but not least, uh, we are going through the final stretch of uh, astronaut selection. As you know, we had 23,000 applications, uh, and uh, this is now down selected uh, in steps uh, uh, to reach uh, some four to six uh, selected uh, astronauts by the end of the year, uh, which will be part of the next uh, astronaut uh, core, uh, in addition to the ones we have now, of course, uh, Samantha being first and foremost the next one we are looking at, and we are really looking forward to her mission Minerva, and uh, very happy to see you, Samantha. Thank you very much, Josef. And with this, I would like to give the word to uh, Minister Kolau. Yeah, thank you, Ninia. Uh, thank you, Josef. I only have uh, three thoughts in uh, increasing order of importance. The first one is uh, related to human exploration and the uh, interest that this activity still has. Uh, I have a thought for the 132 Italian astronaut candidates that have passed into phase two. This is a wonderful sign. It's very encouraging and it proves uh, that uh, uh, human exploration is still at the heart of what we should uh, aim for. So uh, I can only wish Godspeed to all of them. The second, uh, in increasing order of importance, is Minerva. Minerva is uh, a very important mission just because it proves that uh, even you know difficult goals are uh, achievable if you have three things. If you have a vision with courage, and I think. Uh, we all share ESA's vision and courage. If you have uh, wonderful people, competent people like uh, Samantha and all the other uh, crew members that uh, uh, will be uh, in the mission. And then if you have cooperation, international cooperation, which in these days, particularly in these days, it's very important to stress. So it's a great, uh, uh, it's a great uh, celebration of what uh, it was always, should always be uh, the case. And finally, most important for Samantha Cristoforetti, uh, I can only wish you uh, every success uh, for this mission. In a way, you embody what I just uh, described before. So uh, I think it will be a wonderful mission for you. Best of luck. And again, thank you because uh, uh, you, you and the rest of the crew, you embody what we all stand for. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to give the word to Giorgio Sacoccia, president of the Italian Space Agency, ASI. Giorgio. Thank you, Nina, and good afternoon, everyone. Well, I can only uh, support and enforce even more what Minister Colau just said about uh, the importance for Italy of um, space, uh, space exploration at large, uh, human and robotic. And space station and the astronaut on the space station are the most evident uh, uh, signal of uh, what space exploration means for Italy, 
it goes back in time of several decades, our involvement in, in this fantastic endeavor. Um, Samantha will be hosted in, uh, in uh, pressurized modules on the space station that have been built here in Italy. And uh, uh, space station is for us something that uh, has opened the way to uh, important other uh, commitment of, of Italy in the field of space exploration. We want to be part, an important player in the return to the moon. We do this already uh, together with, uh, with the European Space Agency as major contributor to the contribution of uh, ESA to the um, uh, Artemis program. And we will do this also in direct collaboration with the United States. But uh, um, is uh, is only uh, is only um, an element of uh, of our commitment as a country to the to the important field of uh, space exploration. Of course, having Samantha uh, uh, for her second mission on the space station is for us um, something which is first of all an element of pride. Of course, I mean, he's a veteran astronaut. Uh, a human astronaut will be Samantha. You will have, uh, you know, this an incredible symbolic uh, role also. In your uh, a part of all the, all the difficult and complex uh, mission you have to carry out, but you will have a symbolic role for young generations. This morning here in ASI, we had um, several high school uh, students who came here to be. Uh, to receive a prize for their participation what we call the um, Olympics of Space, uh, organized as part of our uh, first uh, uh, National Space Day last December. And uh, to see in the face and the eyes of all these young people the willingness to be part of a future um, commitment, a future uh, program on space activities is really a um, reason for a big hope for us because the future is what they have to build for themselves. And uh, Samantha will certainly be an important reason of uh, inspiration to attract young people to, to STEM subjects and to uh, make sure that uh, in the future, in Europe, in Italy, and in, in, there, there will be uh, an important commitment to space activities, which by all means today is, are recognized as uh, also a major driver for uh, for uh, recovery for uh, economic growth so there is a lot linked to your mission and we really wish you all the best we will be watching you uh, closely during your mission and i'm personally looking forward to see you at kennedy the day of the launch Thank you, uh, Giorgio Sarkocha. Samantha, I will give you the possibility to react to these wonderful welcome statements, I think, before we go into the Q&A. Samantha, the floor is all yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Colau. Thank you so much, President Sarkocha. Thank you so much, uh, DG. I, I really appreciate your uh, warm uh, words of uh, of encouragement, and uh, I, I obviously understand, as we all do as uh, ESA astronauts and astronauts in general, that we have this amazing opportunity, this privilege of, of, of flying to space, because behind us we have, you know, entire countries, entire community, entire um, uh, industries, uh, you know, our, our agencies, the European Space Agency, the Italian Space Agency, and all the national agencies of the member state and that's uh it sounds a little bit rhetorical but i i think as astronauts we really feel that you know all the people we interact with the people we meet and the special character of this community uh, i think there is something to the space community that derives from the fact that most people who ended up working uh, with space did so because they dreamt about it because there's something about space that appeals to the human spirit and that makes especially young people dream and so a lot of the people that are part of this community they work with us because they really were passionate and dreamt probably from childhood and really worked hard uh, to end up um, in in the space business and uh, giving their contribution be it as scientists be it as engineers being as managers maybe ministers <laughs> Uh, so everyone gives their uh, their contribution, and because of this incredible teamwork, then in the end you have this very 
visible, this very powerful event, which is a launch to space and uh, Europeans being able to uh, be up there, work up there and uh, bring forward the uh, science endeavors of the European and world scientific community. Thank you, Samantha. And I see uh, David Parker smiling there and very keen to add something to what you have just said. David, um, please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, although we're having some communications problems here, this, uh, technically, I think you can tell we're not having any communications problem in the message of the importance of Samantha's mission within our whole exploration program. And I really wanted to do two or three things. First of all, which is to thank Italy for the tremendous support towards the exploration program. It's not only the human exploration, also the robotic exploration. All of these elements are part of our bigger vision. We call it Terra Novi. The, uh, the exploration of new worlds, new opportunities, new benefits back to Earth. And so Samantha's mission to the International Space Station is just the next step in this big campaign. And of course, if we were in Kennedy this afternoon, you would be looking out not only at the preparations for Samantha's mission, but we would see the Artemis One uh, spacecraft, the, the whole space, new space launch system, the Orion a, a moon mission, sitting on the launch pad preparing for its launch uh, in a matter of a few weeks time now. And it's an extraordinary thing that we're living in this moment when the return to the moon is really about to start. We have the ESA logo of, atop that rocket preparing to launch to the moon and three uh, opportunities to fly ESA astronauts to the Lunar Gateway, a new outpost in deep space, which we're building right now. And I should say, with a very strong involvement of Italian industry, hardware is really being built already now for the Lunar Gateway. And we're looking forward to making even stronger contributions to exploration of the moon. Uh, the Director General and myself will bring forward to the ministerial proposals for Europe's autonomous uh, cargo lander, scientific lander to the moon named Argonaut. So a series of missions for the 2030s, which will support sustained uh, human exploration of our eighth continent. So the message is uh, Samantha's mission is part of a longer term vision and it's going to be a very exciting one as Europe goes forward for a really strong role in global space exploration. Thank you, Ninia. Thank you, David Parker. Thank you to all the uh, panelists. And I think we can now go straight into the Q&A session. I will start with some uh, English questions first, and then later on we move to Italian. And I would like to give the word to Niam Shaw from Ireland. Niam, if all is good, you should be able to talk and have your microphone unmuted. Yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm off mute. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nina. Uh, Samantha, it's it's. We're very excited here in Ireland for your next mission, and uh, we'll be looking forward to the launch very much. Uh, a question uh, is: How did you find the training for this Crew Four mission using, you know, the SpaceX Crew Dragon in comparison to your previous training for the Soyuz? And is the Crew Dragon really as luxurious as it looks from from Earth? Thank you. I think we have lost Samantha for a moment. Uh, there she comes back. No, I'm I'm, I'm right here. Good. <laughs> yeah, uh, troubleshooting a little bit of uh, laptop issues, but uh, hopefully we'll be uh, fine. Can you guys hear me well? All right. Yeah. Um, Yes, so um, the the Dragon is certainly um, a little bit different than Soyuz in terms of uh, uh, comfort from some points of view, uh, as probably uh, everybody can see from the images, you know, you have a lot more space, the seats are much bigger, uh, especially for, it's not my case, but especially for crew members who are a little bit taller, uh, it, it's certainly nice to, to have a little bit more of uh, internal volume. Um, it has a more modern, um, let's say, um, human-to-machine interface. It's obviously, it's it's the product of a you know a very recent design. So it has like touch screens, and we have iPads uh, that that we can use. Um, so in, in in that sense, it's it's certainly a little bit more comfortable. We will also spend. Uh, quite um, a bit of a longer time on uh, on the way to space station. So Soyuz uh, was a little bit cramped, but uh, it was a very quick ride. Uh, it only took us six hours from launch to docking. Uh, I think nowadays they even do it a bit faster. 
uh, in the case of Dragon, uh, it depends on what day exactly we will launch. So it de will depend, you know, on the weather um, mostly, uh, but it could be anything, you know, between maybe 12, 14 hours if it gets really fast to all the way to over uh, 30 hours. So it's uh, it's certainly nice that we have a little bit more, uh, more space in there. Thank you very much, uh, Samantha. Um, next one to ask a question is Franco Malerba. Franco, can you hear us? Franco, can you try to ask your question? Ah, here you are. Uh, hello. Yes. Um, uh, hello to everybody. Uh, nice to be with you. Um, Godspeed to Samantha. Uh, uh, I have a couple of questions. One, uh, I suggested uh, Dave Parker as a, as the addressee of this question, but it could be asked also to Samantha. Uh, this uh, uh, European robotic arm at last <laughs> is is on board isn't it so this is a great achievement by the way by the uh, european space agency uh, now it was uh, meant to be able to to operate from everywhere on the international <coughs> space station um, during the this validation in orbit which as i understand will be the first time uh, a first with the samantha's mission will it operate also from the uh, russian side and and uh, if so will it be actually actually driven um, by by operators in the uh, in the western side or in the eastern side uh, just a curiosity then to Samata uh, I I uh, was very curious about this uh, experiment with uh, olive oil in, in orbit uh, by the way I come from a region where uh, olive oil is uh, is an excellent excellent product so I wonder where does it come from um, and how will uh, astronauts actually uh, taste it will it just be a matter of exposing it to uh, to weightlessness and uh, and perhaps uh, some sort of uh, radiation environment the space environment or will it will will you actually taste it and uh, and uh, and have pleasure with it <laughs> which i which i really wish uh, uh, be the case thank you Okay, well, maybe I take the first part of the question, Samantha, you can jump in regarding uh, the operations of ERA, and then uh, you, you can answer the olive oil question. So, um, yes, the European robotic arm was launched and integrated aboard the MLM module, uh, known as NORCA, the science module that was brought up to the space station last year. So that is part of the Russian segment of the uh, International Space Station. And uh, commissioning work has been ongoing over the past uh, past months. And uh, the uh, the possibility of uh, an EVA to uh, support the integration and testing that is still being considered. Um, but actually, in terms of the operation of that, probably Samantha is miles better than me to actually explain and discuss the uh, the operation of the uh, European robotic arm. So I hand over. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Uh, so well, first of all, we're all very excited about uh, ERA's uh, commissioning. Um, so it, it, it's interesting because I, I was actually trained uh, myself to operate uh, ERA before my first flight in uh, 2014 um, because it was it was going to launch, MLM was going to launch back then. Uh, for this flight, I have not been personally trained on uh, operating uh, ERA. Uh, I think it will fall on the Russian cosmonauts who are trained to do so, to uh, operate uh, the ARMA. Uh, of course, with uh, with all the support of the integrated uh, European Russian teams uh, from from the ground. And I'm sorry, yeah, regarding the olive oil, I, I think there's two separate uh, small supplies going up. One is for the um, let's say science experiment, and one is in my it used to be called bonus food. Uh, now they call it crew preference food, uh, and in that package there are also a few bottles so that I can uh, have a taste. Uh, taste of home and, uh, and of course share it with uh, my crewmates. Do we know where this oil comes from? 
uh, where the oil comes from, uh, I'm, I'm sure we know it in the sense that I could go and look it up, and I'm sure that that information is available somewhere, but it's not inside my head right now, unfortunately. Okay, okay. well, thank you very much, Samantha. We will look forward to see you back uh, uh, soon uh, and uh, tell us about the olive oil from Liguria. <laughs> 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 All right. That's, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Thank you, Franco, and uh, thanks very much for for joining uh, in a journalist capacity today. Yeah, that's right. Yes, I wear different hats now and then. <laughs> so um, then, I would like to give the word to uh, Dmitri Saitsev from uh, Interfax News Agency from Russia. Dmitri, can you hear us? Um, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Um, you have a question about the spacewalk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, my question has been partly answered. So um, does the program still include the joint spacewalk? Was it was the question? And if so, uh, what additional tasks you have to accomplish uh, spacewalk? Thank you. So maybe I can repeat the question because you were typing it as well. So the question was, does the program still include a joint spacewalk? And uh, with you and the Russian cosmonaut, and if so, what tasks do you have to accomplish during this spacewalk? So uh, I am uh, trained in the Orlan suit, which is the uh, suit for uh, Russian EVAs. And uh, indeed, there is a possibility that I would do a spacewalk together with a Russian cosmonaut. And uh, if, if that will happen, I, I would be, you know, I would be very much looking forward to that. Uh, however, there are, you know, many Russian EVAs planned for the next few months, very much tied to the operations and the commissioning of ERA. So it's an extremely dynamic environment in, uh, in which we, we all have to be flexible, uh, both in terms of whether I will or will not do the CBA, and also in terms of the actual tasks uh, and specific content of the tasks. Thank you, Samantha. And uh, next question is from Carla Bleiko. Carla, can you hear us? You should be able to ask a question now. Your microphone is unmuted. Yes. Yes, you if you me? can speak up a little bit. Yes, I'll do my best. Can you can you hear me? You yes. Okay? All good. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, Samantha, I had two questions. I was wondering um, how it feels for you to be going back to the ISS after almost seven years away and uh, what specific experiments you are looking forward to conducting up there. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, I'm looking forward to having a, a second experience. I, I, I think there is something special about doing something for the first time, you know, the, the, the excitement of it. But I think that there is also something special about doing something for the second time. So you are not so overwhelmed with impressions and emotions and the whole experience anymore. And you can really, you know, kind of like slow it down in your mind and really enjoy it and, uh, and also shape it in the way you want it a lot more because of the experience that you have. So I'm very much looking forward to experiencing, experiencing this again as an experienced flyer and not a a rookie anymore. Uh, in terms of experiments, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, to doing it all. So it's not like I have my personal favorites, uh, but maybe if we want to um, highlight something today, I would certainly highlight some of the uh, new experiments of the um, Italian Space Agency, specifically in the field of life sciences. There's more. Uh, many of them are continuing uh, experiments that have been performed already by previous astronauts, notably uh, Luca Parmitano. And then that's, of course, very important because in science, we, we you know, we, you need multiple runs of an experiment and multiple subjects and samples. Uh, but there's also some, some new ones. Uh, I think the olive oil was mentioned already, but uh, there's another one, um, I believe it's called uh, Prometheo, that looks uh, into the uh, potential of uh, uh, the um, addition of specific antioxidant nanoparticles 
uh, the potential of those nanoparticles to prevent uh, uh, the generation of nervous cell neurons due to uh, oxidative stress, which is uh, very much prominent in uh, the space environment. Uh, and another one, uh, also a life science experiment, looks into the effects of microgravity and the space environment on the function of uh, ovarian cells. And, and that's really interesting, both from a theoretical point of view, right, to help uh, build a theory of organogenesis, you know, the how you build organs during the reproductive function, um, but also uh, what could be targets, potential targets for drugs, for, for medicines to uh, improve ovarian function. Thank you very much, um, Samantha. I think this Thank also uh, this also answers the question from Pierre Francois Morio. I think if not, uh, let me know in the chat if you would like to have an add-on question on this answer from Samantha. I would like to give the word to Eduardo Jamarino from Space Voyaging, who has a question on the SpaceX team. Eduardo, Hi, can, can you hear, hear me? Us? Yes, very well. Please go ahead. Hi, Eduardo Giammarino from Space Voyaging. Hi, Samantha. Could you describe how the preparation with the SpaceX team has been in the months preceding the launch compared to the training you had in uh, Russia for the Soyuz capsule? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, it was uh, very different, I would say, uh, and it's for two reasons. Well, the, the way it was different, it was it's mainly that it was a lot less training uh, for Soyuz. You know, if you put together, add up together all the many weeks and months that I spent in uh, Star City in Russia for my first flight to prepare for uh, my Soyuz flight, it probably adds up to about a year just for Soyuz training. In this case, I had a little more than one year total of, of training, and that included maybe seven weeks of uh, SpaceX uh, training for the vehicle, so a lot less. Uh, and as I said, for two reasons. One is a fundamental difference in the vehicle. Uh, Soyuz, uh, so both of them are in a nominal situation, they're automatic, right? There's very little that I had to do on Soyuz also, because ours was a nominal flight, everything went perfectly, and so the vehicle really flies itself, uh, just like Dragon does. Um, however, in case of off nominal situations, in the case of Soyuz, the crew has a lot of manual intervention uh, capabilities and control of the vehicle on a component level. And for all of that, you have to train, you know, and so it adds up to that entire year of training to be ready for all those off nominal situations. Uh, Dragon relies more on, uh, on the one hand, automatic response of the onboard software, and then a lot of control from the ground. Uh, and so there is a lot of less training that the crew actually needs. Uh, on top of that, I am a mission specialist on Dragon, which is a role that doesn't have a lot of interaction with the onboard systems. While on Soyuz, I was uh, the flight engineer, so I was like a one-to-one -one backup of the commander in terms of uh, uh, knowledge and, and skills. Thank you very much, Samantha. And now I would like to give the word to Maria Oliveira from the Portuguese newspaper Journal de Noticias. Maria, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Very well. Okay, You're good welcome. afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I have two questions for Samantha. Uh, first, I'd like to know, um, when you return from this mission, uh, what do you hope you have accomplished, not only as a professional, but also as a, a personal? A person, um, and also uh, I want to ask uh, how the, do uh, experiments conducted in space uh, can impact life on Earth? I see you thinking, Samantha. You want to take that question? How it's impacting uh, uh, life I, on I Earth? I don't know if you can repeat at least the first time. It's it's breaking, it's breaking up a lot for me. I don't know if it's my problem. I couldn't really understand at least the first part. I can repeat it for you. Okay. Uh, uh, you want me to repeat or? Yes? Okay. So um, I want to know, so when you return from the mission, uh, what do you hope you have accomplished, not only as a professional, but as a person too? 
I hope to have accomplished at the return of the mission, not only as a professional, but as a person as you? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm sorry. It, it, it's um, it's really hard for me to uh, understand right now. So sorry about that. Um, absolutely. So I hope that we will have uh, worked together smoothly and happily as a crew. That's uh, really my number one uh, uh, objective. Um, if you work together well as a, as a crew in a smooth and efficient way, not only as a small crew on orbit, that's what I call the small crew, but also the big crew, so the hundreds of people who support us from the control centers, then I think from the perspective of uh, the crew, and, uh, and especially in my case, also from the perspective of uh, the lead of the USOS segment, I think the mission will, uh, will have been a success. Um, of course, we want to achieve all the science objectives and maintenance objectives and, you know, the era commissioning, potentially the ASA and so on. But we also recognize that there are many, many moving places. This is a very dynamic environment and there's only very little that depends directly on us as crew member. So what we can do as crew member is to perform at our best and work smoothly as a team. So uh, that's my goal. And if we achieve that, I will be uh, very happy upon my return. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Samantha. Just looking here, if we have any more questions in English before we're moving on to the Italian segment. I think there's a question from Carolyn, Carolyn Garrity, a very interesting one on um, diversity and possibilities for people with disabilities, visible or not, to become an astronaut in the future. Maybe this is a question to, to David Parker to answer. David? Um, thank you very much for the question. Yes, it's something that's close to my heart indeed. Um, as part of the ongoing astronaut selection process that, the, that uh, Josef mentioned a few minutes ago. In parallel, we're running what we call the Para Astronaut Feasibility Project, and that involves selecting at least one um, person who is otherwise fully qualified to be an astronaut according to all the normal criteria that we use for selection, but just happens to have a physical disability as part of this project. We intend to select one or two people for, uh, with these characteristics and then work with them in order to make possible eventually a mission to the International Space Station, whereby this is not just a tourist flight, but an operational mission to do science, to do the things that, were, that as Samantha is doing and in her mission. And it will be a very symbolic thing, of course, but also for me, uh, important because overall uh, it's estimated that one in, 20, uh, one in uh, five people had once some sort of disability whether visible or invisible and by starting with visible disabilities we hope to show that space flight really is something for everybody it relates to all, all members of society and so this is a very key project for the future thank you very much david parker and the next question is from emma gatti from space watch global emma can you hear us Yes. Hello, everyone. Hi, Inia. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon. Hi, Samantha. Congratulations for your return to the ISS. I'm really looking forward for your spacewalk and uh, the ovarian cells experiments. My, my question is a bit of a geopolitical question, which I think maybe is a bit expected. You are returning on the ISS in a peculiar and delicate time for space cooperation. And I was wondering if you're afraid that the climate might have changed on board of the ISS or if you feel the responsibility to keep the ISS a place for peaceful cooperation, especially regarding your Russian colleagues. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, for the question. I really appreciate it because it gives me the opportunity to really reassure uh, everyone that on uh, on space station as a crew, the current crew is, is, is working absolutely well and they keep on being not only colleagues but good friends on board and uh, I expect the same for our crew. Uh, you know, we, we obviously recognize that uh, there's a conflict going on on the ground and uh, many of us are devastated by, by, by what we see on a daily basis, but we also know that we have a responsibility 
to keep uh, activities on the space station running. And we really focus on the mission. And as I've said many, many times over the years, you have to focus on what you have in common and not what divides you when you have a mission to accomplish and something that is really valuable and that you care about. And we all care about space station. It's a beacon of hope. It's a beacon of peace. It's a beacon of international understanding. It has been so since the beginning, and I think it continues to be so today. Thank you, Samantha. Have a fantastic trip. Thank you very much. Um, I see there's an additional question on the uh, ISS from Julio Miravals, if I pronounce that correctly. Julio, can you hear us? Julio? Otherwise, I can read your question as well. So the question is indeed on the ISS. Um, he's asking that he was told that the ISS will go out of service almost in uh, 2024. Um, he's asking um, how this issue will evolve in the new situation about the Russian relationships, uh, really in terms of the duration of the ISS. So maybe this is more a question to Josef Aschbacher or David Parker, I think. No, thank you, Nindia, and thank you, Julio. Uh, I was just listening to what Samantha was saying about uh, the station, a beacon of hope, and I think this really is what it is, but also a, a place where fantastic experiments are being conducted, where we really learn so much about uh, ourselves, but also how we can serve uh, people down on, on our planet on the surface by doing all these experiments there. So um, on your question of uh, 24 and beyond, um, as you know, NASA has announced uh, at the end of last year to plan to extend this, the station up to uh, 2030. Uh, we as ESA, we uh, will make formal decisions in our ministerial conference, but my plan is to bring to my member states a proposal uh, to extend as well uh, the operation, at least from our uh, point of view on the ESA part of it, uh, beyond 2024 up uh, to uh, the 2030 timeframe. Of course, this goes in steps, it's not all done at once, at least in our case in Europe, uh, but I will come with a package uh, to ask my member states, uh, Vittorio Colau being one of them, uh, but also all the others uh, to uh, support the extension of the station beyond 2024. Thank you very much, Josef Aschbacher. Um, I think I would slowly like to proceed closing the, the English part of the question and answer, so I would like to ask all journalists uh, that think that they have a question in English that has not been answered yet to put that in the chat so that I can give you the word in a moment. Um, so just reviewing if there is anybody here. So there's a lot of thank you, Samantha. <laughs> I see you're reading it as well. So there's a lot of thank you and good luck from the journalists coming in. Uh, there's a question from Giovanni Caprara. Um, Giovanni, do you want to ask the question yourself? Let's see if we can unmute you. Otherwise, I read it. Giovanni Caprara, Corriere della Sera. Yes, this is a question for uh, uh, General Manager uh, of ESA. Uh, ESA plans to participate in the construction of the moon landing vehicle. So I, I could not fully understand. Could you please repeat? I could understand it well. Thank you. Construction the moon landing. Yes. Uh, is a plans to participate a in construction of the moon landing vehicle made by NASA. No, we have we are part. So thank you. Um, uh, thank you for repeating. Yes, we are part of the um, Artemis uh, program of uh, of NASA, and there are several elements uh, where we participate. Uh, probably the one that uh, was just mentioned, the most visible one, is the ESM on uh, on the SLS, but also on the uh, Moon um, uh, program. Once uh, we go to the next step uh, with uh, the, uh, the the future Artemis flight, uh, yes, uh, ESA will participate with NASA on the Moon landing program. Maybe just to specify, this is all part of the uh, proposals to the ministerial conference again in November uh, this year, which is being put together right now uh, as part of the Terra Nova uh, package, uh, which is our exploration program. David sitting next to me is uh, 
doing the, fi the fine tuning of it uh, with all the member states uh, and certainly uh, moon is a very important aspect but also mars uh, just to be very clear uh, and uh, sustain their uh, cooperation with uh, our partners on the, on the space station yeah so to, if i can further add then so to complement what uh, yosef has said so as I said, we're building European service modules, we're building the elements of the Lunar Gateway, and we're in detailed discussions with NASA for additional contributions to Artemis, with a very explicit goal to secure, let's say, European boots on the moon uh, through cooperation with NASA. And one of the ways we would like to do that is by providing our European lunar landers, the Argonaut series of missions, to take cargo to support the astronauts on the surface of the moon, scientific payloads, instruments, technology, the food and water that the astronauts will need. And this is part of the proposal that we yeah. have for the ministerial. Plus uh, one very exciting proposal called Moonlight, uh, which will provide navigation and communication services around the moon for uh, infrastructure on the moon, but also astronauts on the moon. Yeah. And in all of these cases, there are a lot of very interesting discussions with NASA and other international agencies, uh, as well as European industry to build these systems. So it's a very exciting future as a summary. Thank you, Josef. Thank you, Dave. Um, the next question is from Chuck Fields from Your Space Journey. Chuck, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Very well. Excellent. Thanks so much for taking my question. Hello, everyone. Hello, Samantha. Samantha, I first wanted to thank you for inspiring all of us. Your passion for space, for learning multiple languages, and your love of science fiction, Lucky 42, has excited us all. Uh, thinking back, is there a spark or a special memory that you can share where you first realized that you wanted to become an astronaut? First of all, I would like to underline that I am now flying to space with Expedition 67, and 6 times 7 is 42, so we're always back to the <laughs> answer to the ultimate question. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so I um, I don't have like a aha moment uh, that maybe some other astronauts, especially those who were alive during Apollo, they, they always share those memories of, you know, I saw uh, the astronauts walk on the moon, and I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. For more, it was for me, it was more like a sedimentation of uh, of impressions, and uh, it, it goes back to childhood. But I cannot identify a specific moment. I think it was, um, you know, some of it science fiction and Star Trek on TV for sure. Uh, some of it just the fact of growing up in a small village with a very powerful present night sky and all of those questions and wonders that that uh, brings up, which makes me very sensitive to the issue of light pollution, by the way, and the fact that so many of our children don't have that uh, opportunity, that ancestral experience of marveling at the night sky when they live in, in cities that are very um, light polluted um, at night. Um, but also, I think um, just having the opportunity, you know, living in a small village to go out and play unsupervised and find, you know, adventures in the forest or down by the river, uh, I think gave me a taste for adventure that I really craved for and looked for in, in this job, in the astronaut job. And then growing up, you know, developing all those more mature interests, right? You know, when you start going into middle school and high school and realize you're really into science and, and technology, and that's really something that you're excited about and you want to be a part of. Thank you, Samantha. That was uh, very inspiring. Um, there's one journalist who would like to double check a uh, question to David Parker that indeed ERA commissioning and operations will continue as planned. Could you confirm that? Could you comment on that? That's the current planning. Yes, correct. Good. There's another question from uh, Chiara Dalotomasina. Um, her microphone is not working, so I will read it for her. Um, she would like to know which be, which will be the difficulties that Samantha will face in the new mission. I think it's quite a broad question. The difficulties that you see as the biggest one for you personal in your new mission. Um. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know that I can uh, identify right now one uh, one specific uh, difficulty. Mm -hmm. on, on the contrary, I I feel. Uh, very well uh, prepared uh, for my flight, both uh, you know from the point of view of uh, technical knowledge and uh, and understanding, but also from the point of view of this very very strong bond uh, that we have built with uh, with the rest of the crew, uh, and so I, I I really think we are set up for success. Maybe 
What's one big difference compared to the previous mission is that uh, there is a lot of uncertainty regarding the schedules. You know, the, the launch date is is you know it, it, it slips, and we uh, we have to adapt to this uh, more dynamic scheduling environment. Uh, but uh, you know that that that's pretty easy to do. And uh, other than that, we we will see what uh, what the mission brings us and throws at us. But I, I think we're pretty ready to face any kind of challenge. Thank you, Samantha. Um, I'm reading two additional questions be before I'm closing the, the English speaking session. Um, there's a question from Robert Pogel who is asking if, as if you are very familiar with the ISS, will you have the same personal space as the first time around? With personal space, I guess he means uh, location. The little, uh, the location. You mean the? Uh, yeah, we call those uh, crew quarters, which is uh, maybe it, it brings up the idea of something bigger than they are. They're a little like a phone booth uh, sized, uh, um, you know, sleeping units uh, that we have. Uh, I will. I don't think I will have exactly the same one. Uh, uh, I will have one on the port side this time. I think last time I was in the deck. But they're pretty much all uh, identical, and once you're inside there, you don't really know, you know, in, in space if you're laying on the so-called floor <laughs> or if you're actually, you know, on the wall. It doesn't really matter. And the other question, Samantha, is how you prepare for a six months mission leave in the context of, of course, also your personal life and your family. Is there any way of preparing for that? Yes, I, I think the best way to prepare for that is uh, is to have a, a very good uh, partner. <laughs> so I, I think as astronauts, we are we are all very grateful uh, to our families, to our spouses, to our husbands and wives who have to hold the the home front while we are gone fulfilling our our big dreams. So you know, a, a big thank you to uh to my partner and uh and of course to to all the spouses of our crews uh that uh that makes it possible for us to to do our job and the last question in english is do you hope to be one of the travelers going to the moon in the coming years I mean, uh, you can always hope, of course, but uh, as it has been said uh, today, we're in the process of uh, also selecting a, a new class of astronauts. And uh, uh, I know that we have had uh, not only many applications, but, uh, you know, incredibly high quality applications, very solid candidates, and they will want their chance as well. So, uh, of course, I have some hope that there will also be space for, you know, older folks like me. Uh, but I also realize that uh, we also leave, need to leave some space for, for younger people. Thank you, Samantha. We move on in a moment in Italian, but knowing that Joseph Parker and David Parker will have to leave uh, in a moment, and they will not stay with us. <laughs> it's, it's a nice combination. As I know, you will not be staying with us for the Italian speaking part. I know you would if you could, but you can't. Uh, is there anything you would like to say as closing remarks on this first Q&A session in English before we move on? No, thank you, Ninia. But Joseph Park, you have already combined and showed that we are such a strong team that we speak with one voice. So that's exactly what we're doing. No, just uh, good luck to Samantha. Uh, I will see you uh, for takeoff. I will come, of course, to, to Florida. Uh, but uh, really, uh, uh, all the best also at this occasion of this uh, press uh, event. And uh, just so happy for, for the success you will have uh, coming up very soon, going up to space. So Godspeed. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. And absolutely the same for me, Samantha. I can't wait to see the launch, but uh, congratulations what you've achieved already through the training and the fantastic preparation. And I hope it's a really great mission. I know it will be. Yeah. And let me maybe add one more word of thanks uh, to uh, our member states. I see Vittorio Colau here. I see Georgia Sakocha here. It was said by David before. But really appreciate the strong support that makes all this possible without the strong uh, national support of the member states uh, we couldn't or samantha couldn't do what uh, she's about to do so really big thank you from my side as well yeah thank you and um thank you and uh, see you next time around uh, minister colau now that we are moving into the italian part of the q a session i was wondering if you would like to address the uh, italian journalist here with us 
for in a few sentences in Italian. I know you've done so already in English, but maybe you would like to add something in Italian too. Thank you so much, uh, Nina, for the excellent job you you did. And now I switch to Italian. Buongiorno a tutte e tutti. Uh, non ho molto da aggiungere a quello che è già stato detto. Io credo che uh, siamo qua oggi fondamentalmente per fare due cose, per uh, ovviamente uh, fare l'imbocca al lupo a Samantha, ma anche per ringraziarla perché uh, rappresenta Mentre, mentre lei parlava, riflettevo, rappresenta veramente eh, eh, il meglio che si può far vedere alle nostre nuove generazioni. Eh, duro lavoro, competenza, grande umanità, curiosità, ma anche semplicità. E devo dire che, che veramente, Samantha, grazie perché oggi è, è, così. è stata una bella ora quella che abbiamo passato ad ascoltare e poi ovviamente fai una cosa importantissima come ho detto prima non è solo esplorazione spaziale non è solo scienza ma è anche cooperazione internazionale che di nuovo lo ribadisco in questo momento quello che tu e tutto l'equipaggio sottolineo tutto l'equipaggio farete è molto importante per tutti quindi di nuovo grazie ma non voglio rubare lo spazio ai giornalisti che ovviamente sono interessati più a Samantha che non a me Grazie mille, grazie a lei. So che ci sono delle, dei giornalisti all'ASI eh, nel, nell'auditorium e eh, hanno anche delle domande che vogliono chiedere. Sì. Non... Grazie. Pronto? Sì, grazie Nina, grazie per la linea. E abbiamo, iniziamo subito con Giorgio Pacifici, Rai TG2. Puoi parlare Giorgio. Buon pomeriggio e bentrovata Samantha, in bocca al lupo per questa missione. 2022, missione Minerva, ispirata a un personaggio mitologico che è simbolo di lealtà, di nobiltà d'animo, di operosità. In questa missione Minerva, dove tu, Sabatta, sarai protagonista, assieme ad astronauti di diverse nazionalità e andrete nello spazio insieme, ecco, questa missione Minerva, quanto è un simbolo di speranza, eh, di convivenza pacifica e civile tra persone di diverse nazionalità? Grazie. Grazie Giorgio. Beh, eh, chiaramente quanto una cosa sia un simbolo di qualcosa, naturalmente ognuno e ognuna lo deve decidere per, uh, per sé. Uh, sicuramente quando ovviamente ho scelto questo nome Minerva uh, molto tempo fa, per la verità, confesso <ride> che doveva, avrei voluto già per la prima missione avere questo, questo nome, poi l'abbiamo cambiato in futura, che comunque è stato un bellissimo nome, quindi sono molto felice che, che questa volta abbiamo potuto chiamare questa, questa missione Minerva. Minerva era la dea della saggezza, e la saggezza non è mai abbastanza, no? quindi credo che sia anche un, un auspicio Uh, tutti quanti noi nella, nella nostra vita quotidiana, nel, nel nostro microcosmo quotidiano, nelle nostre re, nelle relazioni uh, affettive e di lavoro quotidiane e poi naturalmente da lì anche alle, al macroscosmo, alle, alle grandi relazioni uh, anche internazionali ci sia sempre, sempre abbastanza, abbastanza saggezza. E poi anche la, la dea protettrice del, degli artigiani, quindi mi, mi piaceva onorare l'artigianalità del, del, del volo spaziale. Ovviamente siamo in un momento in cui c'è un trend verso una sorta di serializzazione, no? quindi che ne so, i mini satelliti che vengono costruiti in, in, in grandi numeri e quindi si può fare una sorta di, di produzione di massa. Però ancora oggi, che ne so, il mio veicolo spaziale Dragon sono migliaia e migliaia di ore di lavoro manuale di, di tanti tecnici e tecniche della, dello spazio e quindi mi piaceva in qualche modo onorare questa, questa capacità artigianale di, di lavorare in maniera pregiata con, con le proprie mani. No. Grazie Samantha. Lascio la parola ad Andrea Bettini, Rai News 24. Sì, grazie, buon pomeriggio. Grazie Samantha, in bocca al lupo ovviamente per la missione. La mia domanda riguarda innanzitutto i preparativi, quindi eh, a che punto siete, come eh, sta andando, cosa farete in questi giorni e, e poi a proposito anche dell'approccio che avrete alla missione, insomma la Stazione Spaziale Internazionale è da sempre un simbolo di cooperazione pacifica a livello internazionale, 
eh, sentite diciamo eh, in questo particolare contesto mondiale che stiamo vivendo anche un po' di responsabilità in più nel rimanere un esempio da questo punto di vista? E dunque, da, per quanto riguarda i preparativi, beh, ovviamente la, la, la parte di, di addestramento formale è conclusa. L'ultima settimana di vero e proprio training è stata quella di, di due settimane fa. Eh, da, eh, da giovedì pomeriggio siamo in, in quarantena, quindi questi 14 giorni in cui eh, evitiamo qualsiasi contatto con persone che non siano all'interno diciamo, della, della nostra bolla, quindi i nostri familiari, il resto dell'equipaggio, i loro familiari, eh, quindi non andiamo più a fare la spesa, non andiamo più al ristorante, i nostri famiglie non vanno, no, nessuno va a lavorare o a scuola e cerchiamo in questo modo, o meglio... <coughs> In questo modo evitiamo qualsiasi uh, esposizione a, ad infezioni che non vogliamo ovviamente prenderci e soprattutto non vogliamo portare sulla, sulla stazione spaziale. Saremo, sono a Houston, saremo qui a Houston fino a eh, probabilmente cinque giorni dal lancio, quindi a, ti dico almeno cinque partiremo su un aereo della NASA, quindi anche lì eh, soltanto con persone che fanno parte della nostra bolla andremo al, al Kennedy e lì resteremo nei cosiddetti crew quarters che sono un, un, un posto abbastanza particolare perché sono le stesse stanzette in cui gli, gli astronauti americani hanno vissuto prima del lancio durante le quarantene fin, fin dalle, no, dalle, dalle missioni storiche degli anni 50 e 60 non, 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 è, non sono cambiati molto quindi è un, un luogo pieno di, di storia eh, ci sono poi tutta una serie di attività da fare al Kennedy, incluso il, il cosiddetto dry dress, ovvero una, una sorta di, di ripetizione generale, di prova generale del, del giorno del, del lancio, in cui faremo esattamente tutto quello che faremo il giorno del lancio, incluso l'ingresso nel, nel razzo. E poi ovviamente non, non lanceremo, ma a un certo punto verrà chiamato uno, uno scrub simulato e quindi uh, ritorneremo fuori per poi tornare a farlo tre giorni dopo uh, davvero. Uh, ci raggiungeranno anche le nostre famiglie, probabilmente a L-4, quindi tutti i giorni avremo anche qualche opportunità di passare alcune ore insieme alle, alle nostre famiglie. E per quanto riguarda una responsabilità particolare, non so se sia una responsabilità particolare adesso al, al nostro livello di, di, di operatori, noi ci concentriamo adesso come ci siamo concentrati in passato e come continueremo a concentrarci in, in futuro sulla, sulla nostra missione, cioè la, la nostra responsabilità è di portare a termine i compiti che, che ci vengono assegnati, mettendo a frutto tutto l'addestramento la, la, che, che ci è stato impartito e portando in qualche modo a compimento il lavoro di, di tante persone, no? perché io lo dico sempre, sulla stazione spaziale magari c'è un'attività in timeline che sono dieci minuti, uh, che ne so, installa questa, questa unità con, con quattro viti, oppure installa e accendila, 15 minuti. Sembrano niente, però eh, quello lì porta a compimento magari anni di lavoro di un team di ricercatori e ricercatrici che hanno preparato quell'esperimento. Quindi ogni cosa, per quanto banale e semplice possa sembrare, lì, è importante, devi dare attenzione, dignità e importanza a ogni cosa che fai in qualsiasi minuto e quindi questo è quello su cui ci concentriamo. Bene, grazie Samantha. Lascio la parola ad Andreana D'Aquino dell'Agenzia DN Cronos che prendo, voglio fare una doppia domanda a te e al Ministro Colau. Grazie, grazie, in bocca al lupo Samantha, è davvero eccezionale. In questo momento poter parlare con te e di tutto quello che tu fai da, da anni, da decenni. Ero molto curiosa di capire la differenza tra volare eh, sulla Soyuz e, e naturalmente ancora non l'hai fatto, ma stai per farlo volare su questo nuovo veicolo. Eh, se ci sono delle differenze se, e quali possano essere. Al Ministro Colau invece vorrei chiedere, ha sottolineato più volte che questa è una missione molto importante. La missione molto importante del sistema Italia, le vorrei chiedere, eh, non potrebbe essere quella di spingere ancora di più su questo settore e eh, su tutti i suoi attori, di cui Samantha è una delle punte di diamante, e in che modo lei nel suo mandato, nelle sue deleghe per lo spazio, sta andando in quella direzione. Grazie.
Vuoi cominciare te? Allora, ma io... Scusate. Um, sì, dunque, le, le differenze. Um, Bad Dragon è un, come penso si, si, si veda anche visivamente, insomma, è un, è un veicolo un po' più grande come volume interno e uh, come, diciamo, uh, più confortevole come uh, sedili. Um, e quindi questo sicuramente è un vantaggio. Forse quello che invece è meno un vantaggio è che ha un volume unico, mentre la, la Soyuz, come, come forse ricordiamo, è, è, è fatta di due, due volumi separati, il modulo orbitale e il modulo di discesa, e quindi diciamo che, che, che c'è la possibilità di, di distribuirsi in moduli diversi, per esempio no? per usare la toilette uno può, può avere un pochino più di, di privacy spostandosi nel, nel modulo orbitale, invece il Dragon è un volume unico, quindi uh, c'è una sorta di, di, di tenda che, 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 si, che si installa per, per dividere in due il, il volume abitabile interno. E, e questo naturalmente lo, lo dovremo fare perché a differenza della Soyuz il viaggio probabilmente sarà un po' più lungo. Dunque, a oggi la data di lancio è il 21 di aprile e, e se, se effettivamente lanceremo il 21 di aprile, cosa che dipende un po' dalla meta. Anche questa è una differenza, no? la Soyuz bene o male quando c'è una data di lancio quella è perché non è molto sensibile alle condizioni meteo. Invece Dragon è particolarmente sensibile, alle, Dragon con il Falcon è particolarmente sensibile alle condizioni meteo, quindi eh, ovviamente sapremo soltanto eh, pochi giorni prima se, se la meteo sarà favorevole oppure no. Però se dovessimo lanciare il 21 aprile avremo un tempo dal lancio all'attracco di oltre 30 ore, credo più o meno 30, 32 ore, e quindi naturalmente avremo, avremo bisogno di, di mangiare, dormire, usare la toilette, quindi di sfruttare a pieno tutti gli elementi di abitabilità del, del veicolo, mentre su Soyuz, se magari qualcuno si ricorda, io feci un viaggio all'epoca di sei ore dal lancio all'attracco, quindi no, non mi spostai proprio dal mio seggiolino, dal mio posto fino all'attracco e, e credo che oggi lo facciano anche più, più rapidamente di, di così. Grazie Samantha, e la seconda domanda era per il Ministro. Sì, io allora la ringrazio per la domanda, credo che abbiamo fatto un grande, abbiamo rimesso lo spazio al centro delle politiche eh, strategiche italiane e quando dico strategiche vuol dire non solo industriali ma strategiche in senso più ampio, eh, sia per quanto riguarda ovviamente il supporto all'esplorazione eh, di cui oggi parliamo, sia per quanto riguarda eh, tutta la space economy, tutto quello che è anche l'inorbit economy che progressivamente diventerà molto più importante. Avevamo un budget eh, di circa 2 miliardi, l'abbiamo più che raddoppiato col PNRR, la, la, domanda, la domanda però alla fine mi, fa, mi porta a dire ma perché? Perché tutto questo? Io credo che ci sono tre perché, c'è sicuramente un perché industriale, perché l'Italia da sempre ha una grande, un grande heritage in questa in quest area e quindi volevamo rinforzarlo, ritornare a puntare in maniera importante sullo spazio. C'è un motivo strategico, un disegno, quella visione a cui accennavo prima, un disegno europeo a cui vogliamo contribuire perché siamo convinti che è giusto e abbiamo le persone, oggi qui ne abbiamo una, ma come ha detto Samantha ci sono migliaia di persone dietro di lei e poi un ultimo motivo perché dobbiamo come paese rinforzare eh, la, le nostre competenze in STEM e devo dire anche e soprattutto quelle femminili e quindi eh, tutto questo ci dà un'opportunità in un colpo solo di avere una strategia industriale, un piano più ampio di visione europea, ma anche un piano di competenze che speriamo nel tempo rinforzi eh, tutto il Paese. Quindi eh, lo spazio è ritornato al centro della strategia del Paese. Grazie Vittorio eh, Culau. Um, ho capito bene che Giorgio Saccoccia vuole anche raggiungere qualcosa? Sì, grazie. Lascio la parola al Presidente dell'Asi Saccoccia. sentite in realtà no non avevo chiesto avrei magari proposto di chiudere però volentieri mi aggiungo ovviamente a quello che ha detto il ministro Colau lo spazio è, è veramente in questo momento un, un elemento ritenuto strategico dal governo e è, come paese l'Italia è uno dei pochi al mondo che può vantare di 
di avere una capacità di eccellenza in tutti i settori applicativi dello spazio, dal, dal, dalle applicazioni, i servizi dell'osservazione della terra, telecomunicazioni, all'esplorazione di cui parliamo oggi, all'accesso all allo spazio. Quindi ehm, per forza di cose ehm, eh, deve e, e, fa, e fa sempre più parte del... del della strategia del paese. Il, eh, come, come dicevo anche prima nella parte in inglese, la, Samantha veramente rappresenta il volo di Samantha e eh, il suo ruolo rappresenta un simbolo importantissimo per stimolare le nuove generazioni e ovviamente sono anche molto felice di poter dire come, come rappresentante di tutta uh, la categoria, la filiera che in Italia si occupa del settore spaziale a partire dalla formazione uh, accademica all'industria, industria dove si intende eh, i, grandi, i grandi integratori fino alle più piccole start up ovviamente l'agenzia e gli enti di ricerca ehm, in qualche modo il volo di Samantha come anche lei ha tenuto a sottolineare rappresenta il, eh, il risultato di una capacità completa eh, di esperienza sviluppata nel corso di decenni fin dagli albori del, del, del volo spaziale, delle attività spaziali, è veramente un motivo d'orgoglio ed è una responsabilità importante che ci sentiamo e che vogliamo ovviamente far crescere insieme al nostro governo. Grazie Giorgio, Giorgio Saccoccia. E la prossima domanda è di Marta Meli. Marta? Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Buon pomeriggio Samantha, grazie dell'opportunità, congratulazioni per la tua missione. Con la mia domanda, eh, Samantha tu stai partendo per lo spazio mentre c'è un conflitto che sconvolge l'Europa, in mezzo a dichiarazioni di guerra che arrivano fino alla stazione spaziale internazionale e ne minacciano il futuro. Con quale spirito ti appresti a svolgere la tua missione e quale a tuo avviso deve essere il ruolo di un astronauta, tu sarai anche leader del segmento orbitale americano in un contesto del genere? Grazie. Grazie Marta della domanda. Intanto ci terrei a sottolineare come, uh, diciamo, al di là di uh, dichiarazioni o notizie un po' colorite che, che si sentono, si leggono a volte, né, soprattutto su, sui social, uh, nessuno, da nessuna parte, uh, nessun membro, partner della, della partnership ISS ha mai messo in discussione la continuazione della, della stazione spaziale. Uh, i team a tutti i livelli questo qua è un, è, è un programma davvero integrato dove a tutti i livelli uh, ci sono team congiunti che quotidianamente si uh, riuniscono no? in, in remoto, in videoconferenze per mandare avanti le operazioni della, della stazione spaziale e questo lavoro congiunto non, non si è mai fermato neanche per, uh, per un secondo quindi questo per tranquillizzare chi abbia magari sentito queste notizie colorite e si preoccupa in qualche modo della, della sicurezza mia o dei miei colleghi di, di equipaggio. E lo spirito con cui affrontiamo questa missione è a livello di relazioni tra l'equipaggio un continuo spirito di, di, di amicizia e di, e di lavorare insieme con, uh, con, uh, con buona volontà e con un atteggiamento positivo. Uh, siamo amici, cioè siamo amici tra di noi, io con i miei colleghi americani, con, uh, con i nostri colleghi russi e siamo colleghi che hanno la responsabilità di portare avanti una missione che, ha un, no, che, che, che è un investimento importante in cui hanno investito uh, ricercatori, scienziati, no, che magari hanno lavorato per anni e anni per preparare degli esperimenti che noi compiremo a bordo durante la nostra missione. Quindi questo è il nostro compito congiunto e lo spirito con cui portiamo avanti e continueremo a portare avanti questa missione ben sapendo e non dimenticando come la stazione spaziale sia stata, sia e debba continuare a essere un simbolo di, di cooperazione pacifica. Grazie Samantha. La prossima domanda è di Paolo Recci Bitti, il messaggero. Eh, pronto, mi sentite? Sì. Eh, <coughs> Tutti voi, grazie a Samantha Cristoforetti, che ringrazio, a cui faccio in bocca al lupo, anche per la toilette con la tendina. 
E volevo, eh, i colleghi mi hanno in parte preceduto, quindi lei non ha mai temuto per il futuro della sua missione anche davanti a dichiarazioni che venivano dal capo stesso di Roscosmos. E l'altra la, parte della domanda a questo punto è se, che cosa porterà di personale con sé in questa missione. Grazie. La, intanto buon, buon pomeriggio Paolo. E, e... Credo, insomma, alla prima domanda credo di avere già, già risposto e per quanto riguarda cose personali che porterò con me, beh, ho, ho, ho tante foto, no? anche, anche insomma, fotografie di, di amici e naturalmente tante, tante fotografie di, di famiglia e, e diciamo che rispetto alla volta precedente mi sono portata magari qualche piccolo, come dire, oggettino, giocattolino, toy direbbero gli, gli americani in inglese per, per magari far, far divertire i bambini dalla, dallo spazio durante le nostre videoconferenze settimanali. Grazie e la prossima domanda è di Camilla Francisi, um, giornale Radio Rai, Radio 1. Camilla? Camilla, ci senti? Camilla Francischi? Allora, la domanda penso sia um, sulla ISS vi trovate in un ambiente estremo e spazi ridotti? L'equilibrio nelle relazioni interpersonali, immagino, diventi ancora più importante. Si possono presentare emergenze improvvise come empatia, condivisione, confronto, sagge saggezza diventano essenziali. Come vi preparate dal punto di vista mentale per la risoluzione della crisi? Avete anche puri e semplici momenti di svago? Non sarà, non sarà certo come organizzare sulla terra un aperitivo, una cinema o una passeggiata fuori città, ma anche il gioco è fondamentale per la forma mentale, giusto? Sono previste EVA attività extraveicolare? Questa domanda mi sembra l'abbiamo già... Sì, sì, sì. <ride> Beh, le domande erano molte, diciamo, però penso di aver colto più o meno il tema eh, generale. Eh, no, il benessere diciamo, psicologico sia individuale che, che del team è, è fondamentale, qualcosa su cui uh, riflettiamo molto. Um, esiste tutto questo tema dei cosiddetti expeditionary skills, quindi le, 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 le competenze da, da spedizione, se vogliamo, che non sono specifica necessariamente solo degli astronauti, ma di chiunque si trovi in un team a dover lavorare, compiere una missione, una spedizione in un, in un ambiente, eh, chiamiamolo estremo se vogliamo, ma se non estremo comunque particolare, dove ci sono delle, delle limitazioni a livello di comfort, dove ci sono magari dei rischi, dove bisogna no, gestire il, il lavoro seguendo determinate procedure appunto per non esporre nessuno a rischi. Uh, inutile e portare a termine la missione in, uh, in sicurezza. Sono delle cose che sono molto presenti nel, nel mondo degli astronauti, si comincia a parlarne già durante l'addestramento basico e poi si, si, si continua negli anni anche con, con delle valutazioni, anche delle peer reviews. No? Quando io sono tornata dalla mia prima missione i miei, i miei colleghi hanno compilato delle peer reviews nei, 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 nei miei confronti eh, riportando no, quello che a loro era sembrato eh, positivo, che io portavo positivamente al team e delle cose che magari invece avrei dovuto migliorare eh, eccetera e la stessa cosa faremo durante, durante questa missione. Eh, sicuramente ne parleremo anche prima, no? ho menzionato eh, qualche minuto fa che, che siamo già in quarantena e poi passeremo qualche giorno tutti insieme a questi crew quarters al, al Kennedy prima, prima del lancio e quindi sarà anche un'occasione per darci dei, dei feedback su questi expeditionary skills prima della missione sicuramente continueremo a farlo durante la missione e ripeto dopo, dopo la missione um, quello di cui io sono, sono convinta però è che con questo equipaggio cioè io veramente ho vinto la lotteria con, con questo equipaggio sia i colleghi uh, russi che sono già a bordo che i tre colleghi NASA con cui uh, partirò a bordo della, della Dragon sono delle persone proprio da un punto di vista umano davvero fantastiche quindi io veramente non, non credo che, che ci potrà essere un problema di, di nessun tipo Grazie Samantha. La prossima domanda è di Stefano Piccin, Astrospace. Stefano? 
Sì, pronto, mi sentite? Sì. Buonasera a tutti. Eh, volevo chiedere a Samantha Cristoforetti come è cambiata la tua visione della missione eh, dopo l'impossibilità di poter essere comandante de dell'intera stazione spaziale. Ah, eh, diciamo che forse è una cosa che <ride> sembra molto altisonante vista da, da fuori, poi in realtà poi dal, dall'interno non è una cosa così, così drammatica come, come può sembrare. Intanto vorrei specificare che io sarei dovuta essere comandante nella parte finale della missione, no? quindi all'inizio della spedizione 68, non è che sarei arrivata a bordo e sarei stata subito comandante perché questo non... No non succede, no? il comandante è sempre la, la persona che è stata a bordo più tempo, inizialmente era previsto che la Soyuz partisse ben prima di, del nostro ritorno e quindi alla partenza della Soyuz sarebbe rientrato a terra Allegarty Emiev, che è il comandante attuale, io avrei preso il comando a lui per le ultime 4, 5, 6 settimane della, della missione, quindi diciamo che per il, per il grosso della missione non è, non è cambiato nulla, uh, anche in quello scenario diciamo che sarei stata il leader della parte non russa della stazione spaziale, poi avrei preso questo ruolo di comandante nella, nella parte finale. Allo stato attuale della pianificazione invece noi torneremo prima, torneremo già verso metà settembre, quindi prima del, del rientro della, della Soyuz e quindi questo non, non succederà. Però diciamo che non, non è che questa cosa abbia cambiato in qualche modo significativo il mio approccio verso, verso la missione. Grazie. Grazie Samantha. La prossima è Enrica Patifolia. Enrica, ci senti? Sì, buon, buon pomeriggio a tutti, grazie. Eh, Samantha, salve, eh, in bocca al lupo per, per la missione. Eh, la mia domanda riguarda la giornata mondiale del volo umano nello spazio, eh, domani, e come sappiamo tutti è, de è dedicata al volo di Gagarin. Gagarin è è sempre stato un simbolo dell'attività spaziale, ultimamente alla luce eh, del conflitto in corso in Ucraina è anche diventato un simbolo politico. Ecco, in questo quadro così difficile a livello internazionale, qual è il messaggio che tu vorresti dare per questa giornata mondiale del volo nello spazio? Grazie. Beh, intanto credo... Beh, intanto buona, buonasera Enrica, eh, intanto eviterei di trasformare il povero Yuri Gagarin in un, in un oggetto di, di discussione politica che sicuramente non, non merita, è, un, è stato il primo essere umano nello spazio, quindi come tale un, un pioniere e un, un, un simbolo di un, come dire, di, di un achievement, di una, di una conquista per, per tutta l'umanità ed è questo che celebriamo credo il, il 12 aprile, no? quindi eh, celebriamo l'inizio dell'era spaziale per tutti noi, per tutti noi esseri umani. E la prossima, penso anche l'ultima domanda, è di Elena Dussi, eh, La Repubblica. Elena. Sulla, sulla funzione ovarica nello spazio. Vorrei per piacere da Samantha qualche dettaglio in più in cosa consisterà e quali risultati potrebbe darci. Grazie. E... Io adesso, se devo essere proprio sincera, più di quello che ho detto prima non credo di, non credo di sapere, cioè ci saranno delle, delle cellule di tessuto varico, delle specifiche cellule, perché adesso io non sono una biologa, ma chi, chi si intende di queste cose saprà che ci sono no, di, diverse cellule di diversi tipi che fanno parte del tessuto ovarico e, e alcuni specifici tipi di, di queste celle verranno portate in coltura sulla stazione spaziale, verrà eh, osservata l'influenza dell'assenza dell di peso e dell'ambiente Uh, spaziale in generale sulla, sulla funzione ovarica, su, sulla funzione endocrina, la, la, la produzione di, di ormoni uh, e che, che insomma, per, per quello appunto che posso avere capito io da, da, da ignorante non, non biologa si possono acquisire delle, delle informazioni che insieme a tante altre informazioni, cioè non, non solo questa, ma può essere come dire un pezzo del puzzle con cui scienziati e le scienziate possono poi mettere insieme un modello dell'organogenesi, cioè come si formano gli organi no, durante la, 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 la funzione riproduttiva del, non solo degli esseri umani, ma credo in generale dei, dei mammiferi. 
Tutto questo poi quando a livello scientifico di, di ricerca fondamentale si acquisiscono delle, delle conoscenze su come funziona la biologia, eh, diciamo in particolare umana, poi a livello applicativo questo ti può dare delle idee su ehm, interventi medicamentosi che tu puoi sviluppare che hanno no, dei, dei, dei target particolari che tu hai scoperto perché hai capito come funziona la biologia e quindi puoi sviluppare dei medicinali che possono per esempio migliorare la funzione ovarica o eh, come dire supportare la, 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 la funzione riproduttiva umana. Ho oh, risposto alla domanda che questa domanda mi mette sempre in crisi perché sono un'ingegnera quindi però <ride> spero di aver detto qualcosa che ha senso compiuto. Elena, no, ho risposto alla domanda? Sì, sì, certo, va benissimo. Eh, no, ma... no, perché voi giornalisti scrivete sempre che io sono una scienziata, io non so più come dirvelo, io non lo sono, sono un'ingegnera. Vabbè, no, era, era una cosa che mi aveva molto colpito e incuriosito, non avevo mai no, sentito nulla del genere, quindi sono, sono, sono contenta insomma, che, fatto, che si parli anche di questo. Bene. Samantha ingegnera, quindi Grazie. perfetta per definizione. Sì, sì, vabbè, Elena, se hai bisogno, ciao, sono Giuseppina Piccirilli, se hai bisogno di maggiori informazioni su questo esperimento, ci possiamo sentire più tardi, ti possiamo dare qualche altra indicazione, insomma, siamo qui. Grazie. Sì, siamo già alla fine, Vedo, abbiamo oltre due minuti, voglio ringraziare Samantha Cristoforetti, il ministro, anche Giorgio Saccoccia, Asi, tutti per essere qui eh, oggi e Samantha in bocca al lupo e ci sentiamo, grazie mille, grazie mille. Grazie il lupo. Grazie tantissimo anche da parte mia e un applauso per Ninia che ha moderato anche la parte in, in italiano in maniera eccellente. Bravissimo. Grazie. Brava. Grazie, grazie. In bocca al lupo. In bocca al lupo, bocca al lupo Samantha. Happy, grazie a tutti. Buon pomeriggio. Grazie, grazie, a, grazie a tutti.